Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast, where we seek progress, not perfection. Hello, and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. This is super exciting. Tro, welcome, man. Yeah, I'm really, really excited. Actually, you know when I got excited uh, first is when I saw this guest talk at Low Carb Denver. He gave an, gave an amazing lecture on cholesterol and low carb dieting. And so I, I got really excited. This is Dr. Nadir Ali. He's an interventional cardiologist. He's actually the chair, the chairman of uh, cardiology at Clear Lake Regional Medical Center. He is the most active interventional cardiologist. And he's going to talk to us today about lifestyle medicine and how over the last several years he's dived into this low carb research and, and gone further and further down. Uh, the the uh, the data and now he's you know changing lives putting on conferences and I'm I'm just so humbled and excited to have you here Nadir Ali thank you for joining us and and plus we're like we're intimidated by this guy he's so awesome and then we're at the at the meeting and he's so nice and so cool and it's so such such a breath of fresh air with all these smart guys that have to deal with me and Tro everyone else tries to get away and he actually kind of was nice and talked to us and and humored us so. Nadir, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Hey, I, I'm just totally flabbergasted by the, the praise that both of you have laid on me. And if I didn't have this Indian complexion, you would see me blush. Well, thank you. I'm honored. I'm truly honored. Well, tell us your wisdom. The students are here to learn from the master. So everything you do, we love. I listen to your, I, I mean, I, I find myself just nodding my head yes whenever you're talking. And, and I admire your courage to come out. I, I've seen you, you're, you're such a, humble, kind person, but I see you stand up and go, no, nah, that's not true. Here's what, here's what the data shows. Here's what we're seeing. That's what I love about you. So tell us what you've learned, what you'd really like our listeners uh, uh, to understand. And, and keep in mind, our listeners are, are not Ivor Cummins listeners. Like <laughs> Some of us are a little <laughs> bit more simple. At least I say that as an excuse because if I don't understand it, I feel kind of silly. But you know, uh, uh, you know, getting the point across where, where it's people are going to understand because you're so darn smart that the rest of us will sit here and Tro and I will talk afterwards, try to figure out what you're saying. Well, uh, I, I hope that is true. And I hope it's worth your time and the listener's time. Um, so, uh, you know, I think my transformation came about six years ago. Uh, before that, uh, like Tro mentioned, I used to spend almost my entire time in the cardiac cath lab because I was very good uh, interventional cardiologist opening up the blood vessels with balloons and stents. And I really didn't want to have any part of seeing patients in the office to manage their cholesterol, their blood pressure, their diabetes, because I was just frankly uh, disgusted that none of those things work. So I used to tell my partners, you see the patients in the office, I'll fix them when they come to the hospital having chest pain or blockages. And I don't really want to be involved in seeing patients in the office because nothing I do seems to work. And then back about 2012, 13 timeframe, um, you know, I, I've been a cyclist for uh, a number of years, at least a decade before that time. And I might found myself slowly gaining some weight. You know, when I first came from India to the US, my weight was right around 145 pounds. And I went up to about 185 pounds back uh, about uh, 10 years ago. And I tried my best to lose that weight. No matter what I did, uh, you know, I went vegan, I did uh, low fat, uh, I starved myself, I exercised myself to death but I would lose weight for a short time and it would kind of yo-yo, it would just go right back. So at that time I was listening to a podcast. It was an Australian, it was not even low carb down under and there was this physician, uh, Zeeshan Arian, and he was talking about working with rugby players and using a low carb diet. And I said, man, this guy is making sense in terms of how much carbs we can store, how much fat we can store, how we can utilize ketones, especially for endurance athletes. So I decided to try that. I remember it was like December and I was in the holiday time frame when I was listening to YouTube podcast. And when I started doing that, in about 
one month I had amazing results. In six months, I was down to about 145 pounds. So it was the same weight that I arrived in US with. And uh, my cycling performance got better. I used to then be able to keep up with my racing team. So I said, if this works in me, why can I not try it in my patients? And since then, it's been six years. And this, since then, it has been an amazing journey. And some of the things that have come that have been sort of obstacles that made me think and refine my uh, understanding of human biology better is that when patients came back with uh, weight loss, with reduction in their hemoglobin A1C, and I started measuring their insulin levels back in 2013, and I would see their insulin levels drop, I would see their uh, insulin resistance go down. And I don't know if you want me to pause here and describe what insulin resistance means, but I'm sure most of your speakers understand. So just for brevity, uh, what I started finding is that all biologic markers improved, the patients were feeling better, but the LDL went up. And I must tell you right off the bat that even though uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist and even though I'm sort of a mainstream cardiologist, uh, even before I became low carb, I was never truly impressed by the statin data. I thought that statins were a fraud. I didn't want to use them. I didn't want to prescribe them. I didn't want to take them myself because by that time I was middle-aged and you would expect that any cardiologist who truly believes in the statin data should prescribe statin and take it himself. But I've always been a skeptic of that. So I never truly pushed the use of statins in my patients. If they came and said, told me they had muscle aches or they didn't want to take it, I said, fine, that, that's, that's a decent idea. But I did see that the LDL kept going up in these patients. And to me, that was bothersome. And I think that's about the time when Dave Feldman came out at Low Carb uh, in BREC and talked about the um, uh, lean mass hyperresponders and the hypothesis as to why the LDL goes up. Um, so that was a very intriguing part. And this journey has been extremely transformative. Uh, I think I want to pause at that time and see if that's the direction we should go in. Should we focus on something else in our talk? No, this is this is pure gold. I, I just want to harp on two things you said. One is, you know, you're going from being an interventional cardiologist. You're so frustrated with the fact that you're unable to help your patients with lifestyle that you say you don't even want to see them. I mean, we we talk about the epidemic of physician burnout. And here you are, you know, helping people, opening up their closed vessels. And it's like, you don't, like, that's the only way you can help. You don't want to do anything else. And then you just happen to stumble upon low carb after trying everything else. And then you look at the data and your eyes begin to widen and open and you do it for yourself. And you cannot unsee what you've seen. And so this is like a recurring theme we hear, Brian. I mean, it, it's like, Every single low carb provider has this, you know, origin story. And then now here you are, you know, giving lectures on how cholesterol increases uh, in low carb diets. And you talk about lean mass hyperresponders and you talk about statins. And these are all such crucial topics. Brian, what do you think? Well, you know, Troy, the more I'm around, the less I trust these guys. You know, it, it, you start looking at it. Look at Nadir. This guy is making a lot of money doing caths. He can't be that smart to now want to prevent his, he's putting himself out of business. This guy, Rob Sivas, who's a bariatric surgeon, is helping people to lose weight without cutting on their bellies, right? Unless necessary. Then you have Gary Fetke, who has an endless supply of limbs to amputate as an orthopedic surgeon. And they're all saying, hey, we can prevent this. So I think these guys go into medicine to help people actually, Tro. They don't go in to make money. It's kind of, something's wrong with these guys. What do you think? <laughs> no, you know what the other unifying the other unifying feature here is they're all critical thinkers. I mean, here Dr. 
you know, Ali, maybe we can talk about statins a little bit because every single one of my patients has a question about it. They see, maybe they, you know, about two thirds of my patients, either with weight loss, their cholesterol goes up, uh, goes down or stays the same. And about one third, it can really rise. And they're left asking me, you know, after they get a CAC, after they get their FH testing, you know, their fam, their genetic testing for these genetic markers of high cholesterol, you know, they ask me, well, what should I do? And sometimes we see cholesterol LDLs of 200 and 300. I've seen LDLs as high as seven and 800. So can we talk about statins and can we talk about uh, these genetic causes of high cholesterol and, you know, how does it all relate to the lean mass hyperresponder? Are they not related? And so should we view it separately? And what do we do clinically? What do us, you know, what are the patients who are hearing this with a cholesterol of, you know, an LDL of 300, what should they think? And what uh, should us, you know, primary care doctors trying to get people to do, uh, uh, trying to get people to do low carb approaches, what should we tell them when their LDL is 300? That's uh, such a beautiful question, Tro. And I think we should get into it in some detail. So um, I gave a talk at uh, Keto Summit, Berg's Keto Summit uh, on the, the title of the talk was Do Statins Prevent or Cause Heart Disease? And uh, even though I am saying it, it was one of the best presentations on statins and cholesterol that I have ever given. I think it's even better than the one from Low Carb Denver. And uh, there were about 700, 700 attendees and uh, Dr. Burke told me that it was voted as the best presentation of the conference. Uh, it's not yet out on YouTube, but I want to share a few of my ideas from that uh, talk. So number one issue is that when you start a statin on somebody, you go to initiate that drug in somebody in their 30s, sometimes in their 40s or in their 50s. So you're going to give a drug like this to someone for 40 to 50 years. And I think that any physician that is making an intervention in a person of that duration for sure should do what all medical professions are asked to do, which is to do an informed consent. So they should talk about the risks of the drugs, the degree of benefit and the duration of therapy. So if you look at the cholesterol literature, it's all being hijacked by saying LDL is bad. But what I would like to submit is that nature created LDL for a certain reason. And nature has already done an experiment for us. And that experiment is a condition called A beta lipoproteinemia. So it's a long word, but basically all that means is that these people have either an absence or very low levels of LDL. So there is a genetic condition in which LDL is either absent or low in amount. And that's the exact condition that we are trying to create these days by using high dose statins. And we are going even further by using that new drug, the PCSK9 inhibitor, in which the LDL levels go about 30 milligrams per deciliter. So when you take the importance of a beta lipoproteinemia as a genetic condition from which we can understand, the simple question I pose to people is that, hey, these people with absence of LDL, they should get no heart disease. They should live forever. One would expect that they should live forever. But it's hardly any individual in this group that survives beyond their fourth and fifth decade they get blind, they get attack, ataxia, which is like they don't, they cannot move well. Uh, they have um, recurrent infections. So when you are looking at a genetic abnormality in which LDL is absent, you can infer as to the role that LDL plays. So if I were to tell you that LDL is important in host defense, it prevents you from getting infections that LDL is important in cell repair. When your tissues get damaged, it needs to repair the tissue and LDL is an important molecule. When I tell you that LDL is very important for antioxidant function, it's, it mops up 
the antioxidant damage, the oxygen free radicals that cause tissue injury, that this is a particular molecule that is endowed with the properties to help us with that. If I tell you that LDL is important to carry fat soluble vitamins, uh, one of the reasons why people with genetic absence of LDL get in uh, blindness is because they don't carry vitamin A, they don't carry vitamin E. So fat soluble vitamins, LDL is a carrier molecule for that. They get cerebellar ataxia because, which is the in coordination with movement because brain development is dependent on cholesterol. So unfortunately, Physicians are not taught that the cholesterol is a biologically important molecule and that cholesterol is carried in our bloodstream like a lipoprotein. One of them is the LDL molecule. And that LDL molecule has a lot of important biologic functions. So that is what a physician should be taught first. He should not be taught that LDL is the causal factor for vascular disease, heart disease, and strokes. That may be a possibility. It's by no means clearly defined yet. I don't think the biology of that is worked out uh, in such a way that it's a definitive finding. So the mistake that medical profession is doing right now is that it is making us think that low levels of LDL are good. What I would like to argue is that LDL is an important biologic molecule that helps us fight infections, reduce cancer risks, carries fat soluble vitamins, carries CoQ10, is an important part of cell repair and reverse transport of cholesterol. And when you try to reduce this molecule without actually thinking how you can improve the quality of your lipoproteins, which means the quality of your cholesterol, I think that you're making some very fundamental mistakes as a physician. And this is where critical thinking of every single physician prescribing this medicine is important. You know, can I, can I, uh, I want to harp in because I want to give you, I want to play the devil's advocate here because you're preaching to the choir. Everything you say, I 100% agree. But I want to um, give some credence to the way our opponents will present their opposing argument. And I'd like to hear how you'd respond. Now, if we look, I, I, you know, all of my patients, I, I'm very lenient with uh, an LDL that I would tell them I would be concerned about. If I was concerned, you know, I'd risk stratify them with a CAC or a CIMT. I'd, I'd CAT scan their heart, look for calcifications. I'd look at the thickness of their carotid uh, artery and see if there's any marker of inflammation. I would fix every other known cause, smoking, inflammation, diabetes, glycemia. I'd fix these causes in an effort to mitigate any potential negative impact from that LDL. But... If we talk to people who are, you know, these lipidologists, they'll say, look, we take all the statin trials, we take all the LDL lowering trials, the, the uh, new injectable drugs, and we take all the genetic causes of increased LDL and we put them on a, on a, on a graph. And when we line them all up on a graph, they linearly increase, you know, LDL linearly increases with cardiovascular outcomes. So, so they're coming us, to us saying, like, look, we have this mosaic theory of evidence showing that, you know, higher LDL causes more cardiovascular disease. And then, so what is a doc like me supposed to do when a patient comes to me? I, you know, they're fixing their lives. Yeah, they lost a little bit of weight. They're still obese. You know, their, their glycemia is resolved. Their pattern of LDL on their NMR is improving. But they have an LDL of 200 or 300 you know, and, and maybe I even tested their genetic, you know, uh, uh, for, for genetic testing and it's negative. I mean, I left or their calcium score is zero or low. I mean, I don't know what to do. What would you, what would you tell me? So uh, excellent question. And I come across this all the time and I get uh, 
uh, a lot of uh, criticism from my colleagues. I get reported to the administration that here is a doctor who's taking people off of statins and killing them. And my answer to that is, first of all, I don't. I give them informed consent and patients decide what they want to do. But true, there is a lot of contrary data to what you have told. So there is tremendous amount of epidemiologic information that points that high cholesterol is good. There is the Danish study in 50,000 patients, 10 year follow up, higher the cholesterol, lower the overall mortality, lower the cardiovascular mortality in women, no difference in cardiac mortality in men. So that's 50,000 patients there. There is another study that Ravnaskov and Michael Kendrick and David Diamond put together of predicting mortality on the basis of LDL levels. And higher the level of LDL, there was lower risk of not only all-cause mortality, but cardiovascular mortality. I can take you through several trials in older patients. Uh, there is a trial of 10,000 odd patients in uh, Netherlands, in the town of Leiden. Uh, they took 10,000 patients and they followed them for about, sorry, 1,000 patients and followed them for 10 years prospectively. And what you found is that higher the cholesterol, lower the risk of all-cause mortality, cancer mortality, and infection mortality. So you would say, hey, uh, a lowering of cholesterol is a sign of ill health. This person is becoming sicker, and that's why they're not making cholesterol. So basically, a person with low cholesterol is destined to die very soon, so you can't take that. So we said, okay, if that is the case, let us not count any deaths that are happening in the first year after the study was started. And there is no difference in outcome. And we should also like to point out that when you look at total cholesterol, approximately two thirds of that total cholesterol is LDL. So if your total cholesterol is high, so would be your LDL. Now, this is epidemiologic information that I'm giving you. Now we can go to clinical trials, the statin trials in a bit, but before we do that, let's talk about what are the potential side effects of statins? Where is the biochemical mechanisms that statins can be harmful? So let's talk about insulin receptor. So insulin receptor uh, sits in cholesterol rafts. So our every cell in our body has a cell membrane. And the cell membrane, the integrity of that is put together by cholesterol accumulating in certain regions, which is called cholesterol rafts. So the insulin receptor happens to sit right at the location where there is high cholesterol density in the cell membrane, the cholesterol raft, as I described a second ago. Now, our body makes about 1.5 grams of cholesterol, sorry, 1500 grams of cholesterol every, uh, I'm, I'm saying that wrong, uh, 1500 milligrams of cholesterol every day. So if I ate no cholesterol, my liver would be charged to making 1500 milligrams of cholesterol on a daily basis. So the body has about 32 different steps. So you take a small molecule like acetyl-CoA, which is basically breakdown of sugars or fats or proteins, it takes that molecule and it puts it through 32 different steps and makes a cholesterol molecule. So when you give a cholesterol lowering drug statin, you interrupt that chemical pathway very early on in a, at, a, at a location called HMG-CoA reductase. So you are reducing the production of CoQ10 you're reducing the production of uh, cholesterol, you're reducing the production of dolichol, which is an intermediate in the cholesterol pathway. You are reducing the production of prenyl intermediates. 
So one of this molecule, Dolicol, is very important in processing the insulin receptor in every cell. So if you are giving an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor, you are inhibiting the processing of insulin receptor. There is another intermediate, which is called prenyl receptors. Prenyl, prenyl receptors, they process the pore, the hole through which a cell takes in sugar. It's called GLUT4. So GLUT4 is like a cellular hole and the sugar comes in and attaches to the cellular hole and it then gets into the cell, inside the cell for it to be utilized. So the processing of this glucose pore, which is called GLUT4, is affected by prenyl intermediate. So if you reduce cholesterol production, you're going to reduce how the insulin receptor sits on the membrane of the cell. You're going to affect its processing and you're also going to affect the processing of the GLUT4, uh, which takes in the sugar into the cells. Now, this is biochemical information. Does this translate into clinical information? So I'll give you information on that. You take women, women's health initiative study. They took women who were on statins and who were not on statins. The women who were on statins, the incidence of diabetes was about 10%. And in the women not on statins, the incidence of diabetes was 6%. This is a 4% increase. Now we're talking about an absolute increase of 4%. Now, if you happen to be a Hispanic, or if you happen to be somebody of uh, Native American background, the difference was not 4%. The difference was something like 8%. You had an 8% higher chances of being a diabetic. Now, that is not all. There are studies that talk about how at a biochemical level, the insulin receptor processing is affected and how that translates into clinical outcomes. And I have detailed that in my talk, I don't want to get too geeky out there, but I want to move on about the impact of statins on CoQ10. So we said as we are making cholesterol, we are also making CoQ10. And when you reduce cholesterol production, you reduce CoQ10 production. Has that been demonstrated? Clearly in multiple different studies, you do muscle biopsies, on people on statins, and you find that the level of CoQ10 in their muscles, in their mitochondria is reduced. But is that all? Is that all the clinical inf information? No. You have reduction in CoQ10. You have reduction in energy generation. As you know, our mitochondria are like the engines of the cell. They generate energy in the form of ATP currency. So you find that the energy production is reduced in people who are taking statins who have a lower CoQ10 level. So I'm giving you certain key pieces of information that tell you that LDL is crucially involved in all of these biologic processes, helping diabetes or help, helping the insulin receptor helping us fight infections, helping us in terms of our muscle function. And yet, you're gonna give this molecule to somebody for 50 years, and no physician who is giving this molecule to somebody for 50 years is ever going to talk to them about the potential for diabetes, about the potential for muscle dysfunction, about the potential for its effect on dementia and cognition, about its potential effect on depression. So I think it is fundamental that a physician do informed consent when they prescribe a statin. And testosterone also, some guys care about that. The sex you, could, you couldn't be more right, Brian. I, I, in, in, in everything that I was trying to talk about, I didn't want to just be a mon monotone about everything, but LDL is an important molecule that supplies the raw material, which is cholesterol to our testis to make testosterone and to our ovaries to make estrogens. 
there is an epidemic of erectile dysfunction and low testosterone that is happening throughout the US and throughout the world. And I'm not sure if this is not a direct consequence of our enchantment by prescribing statins to everyone. I, I want to pause here a little bit, let you guys comment, and then I want to kind of focus a little yeah. bit on the statin data, if I may. And My then turn, Tro. My turn, Tro. No, Brian. <laughs> Come on, man. Now, let me just, let me just make this He's just so point. good. I want to ask him a question. He's just so good. We both I, want to ask him I, questions. I, Go ahead. I'm not really interested in any of this stuff. I just want to annoy people who think I talk too much. So I'm, I'm, I'm just asking a question just to ask. No, seriously, I, I'm enthralled by this because I'm stepping back and looking also as an internal medicine doc. Look, people can lose weight. They could do all this stuff. We have legal risk of not prescribing statins because of the perception, not the reality necessarily. The American Endocrine Society, they said, look, here's five risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Having a big belly, right? The central obesity of uh, insulin resistance. Hypertension, a lot, of coral, a, a lot of causation from elevated insulin levels. Elevated sugar levels, uh, decreased HDL, elevated triglycerides. The low carb, ketogenic, intermittent fasting uh, takes away all five of the things they're concerned about. So. My, my question is this, and also going back to the Columbia trial where they said, look, having elevated that Ivor Cummins talks about a lot, having elevated insulin was the number one factor. Now, when we look at all these things, the, the common denominator in all five of those things is elevated insulin levels. What you're talking about with the cell membranes, Ben Bickman said the same exact thing. He said, look, you're vegan. You don't ever eat. You don't, your body is making cholesterol. Now, my question for you as the expert, you are, okay. If I have this big fluffy LDL floating around that my body makes that's not trying to kill me from what we're understanding from a cardiovascular standpoint, it becomes pathological once you have this small dense LDL, which is, is caused by elevated insulin levels, elevated sugar levels. Um, so I'd like to hear your opinion on that. And we're talking about um, K2, D3 being preventive for this transition of, of getting the oxidized. What I'm getting at is this. It's like a sucker. If you take the wrapper off the sucker, this is the way I think about it, and you touch it, it's not that sticky. Now you lick it once and it's oxidized and it sticks to everything. Is this what we're dealing with? Is this the, is this the pathology? And the reason I ask the question also is, look, if you're diabetic, you have a 65 to 85% chance of dying of cardiovascular disease. Why is it that if your LDL is 60, we say you still need to be on a statin? Every diabetic has to be on a statin based on our guidelines. So I'm curious to hear your opinion as a cardiologist and understanding biochemistry like no other, uh, is this an accurate assessment or does this uh, seem far-fetched to you? I think it's totally misplaced and misguided because uh, I can take you through some of the important uh, information that I see day-to-day -day on a clinical practice level. Most people with diabetes, if you take an average age group uh, and, compare, and have a comparable age group of non-diabetics, the diabetic people are gonna have a lower LDL than their non-diabetic counterparts. So you know that LDL is already suppressed and the reason it is suppressed is because of what you said just a minute ago, that these people have high triglycerides. High triglycerides is a marker that you have high VLDL levels. VLDL is the precursor of LDL and you have low levels of HDL. So in my practice, I use triglycerides and HDL as a surrogate marker of insulin resistance. So the next question that you said is that, hey, you know, when you are a diabetic, you have these LDL molecules that are not large and fluffy, they are small and dense, uh, they are sticky, they are going to get into the uh, blood vessel wall and cause atheroma or plaque and, and, and that's bad for you. And what I'm trying to get at is that, tell me, is that definitely established? In other words, do we know that for sure? And in all my readings and looking at all the molecular data, there is still a question whether the LDL is arriving at that location as a rescue molecule or as a causal factor. And whether it is small dense or large and fluffy, I'm not sure that it is causing any real harm because I think the real harm is being caused 
by insulin resistance, which leads to inflammation, which leads to attracting inflammatory mediators like cells that come in and repair and damage the area. Insulin resistance also leads to high blood pressures because it's a vasoconstrictor. Um, insulin resistance also leads to high blood pressure because it makes the kidneys retain salt. So uh, insulin resistance is also a factor in vascular disease because it reduces nitric oxide, which is an important vasodilator in the blood vessels. So we should leave open the question whether any LDL is a causal factor or just one of the mechanisms by which our body is trying to deal with inflammation and repair rather than be the cause of vascular disease. So my view of LDL has evolved a lot because I have taken diabetic individuals, hemoglobin A1C uh, of about 12 or 14. So these are type one diabetics. Their LDL level when their hemoglobin A1C is 12 or 14, which is very high blood sugar levels. These are average blood sugar levels in the 300s to 350s. And I have looked at their LDL at that time. Their LDL was only 60. Now these people, decided that mainstream medicine is not doing them the right thing. They went rapidly low carb. They stopped eating even vegetables and their hemoglobin A1C, believe it or not, came down to less than 5.6. I have some patients that have a hemoglobin A1C of 4.9 and they're type one diabetics. Now, what happened to their LDL levels? Their LDL levels skyrocketed. Now they are in the 300s, some in the mid 200s, some in the 300s. And as they got better with their diabetes, their LDL increased. Their triglycerides, which were somewhere in the thousands, went down to less than 100. Their HDL went up. So now you are telling me that, hey, uh, uh, an ordinary uh, physician, a mainstream medicine is telling me that you are killing this guy with your nutrition, but they're not seeing that how this guy has completely changed his diabetes and is basically has normal blood sugars like anybody else who is a normal person, not a type one diabetic. And the mechanisms why LDL is going up in that situation was not well understood. So let's discuss that. It, is that okay, uh, Brian, as to why LDL would go up in a person who's a type 1 diabetic who's just completely stopped consuming carbs or any low carber who is a hyper responder? Yeah, I would love to hear you. I'd love to hear anything you want to talk about. Tro and I will try to be as quiet. All we want to Wait, do is ask questions of the I, while you're here. No, no. Let me chime in while I got the master. Can I ask a question? Can I ask you? So can I paint two pictures and maybe you help me? I'm going to give you two uh, you know, this is not medical advice, but I'm going to give you two, like, you know, examples of patients in my practice. Sure. I have one patient who, you know, is uh, in his 50s, is morbidly obese, is doing low carb, but kind of weight maintaining, struggling, a lot of stress. Uh, he has resolved insulin resistance, but he still has, di you know, he's, he's still A1C, you know, around the pre-diabetic range, but insulin levels come down. And his LDL is 190. His not his genetic testing is negative. He's got a CA score, CAC score in the 99th percentile. And I want to mm -hmm. juxtapose that to a 50-year-old female who is thin, um, lo low carb, feels great, low carb, has a zero CAC score and an LDL, the same LDL. Okay, 190. Do you approach these any differently? So uh, in a way, yes, and in a way, no. So for the first man who is morbidly obese, uh, slightly pre-diabetic, and probably his insulin resistance is improving on a low-carb diet, but has a CAC score in the 99th percentile, I would be a lot more aggressive in evaluating him for coronary artery disease but would I treat him differently? And when I say treating him differently, would I recommend a statin in him? Um, 
the answer is that I would give him all the data on statins. I'd give him all the risks and benefits and I'd let him choose. But one of the uh, things that we got to address here is that coronary calcium came in the picture. And you're saying this guy has a high coronary calcium and hence I'm going to give you a statin. What if I showed you that the data that clearly demonstrates that even the most ardent lipidologist would agree that taking statins will increase coronary artery calcium score. And there is a biologic mechanism for that. The biologic mechanism is that when you, when you stop the production of cholesterol, you reduce the production of prenyl intermediates. And these prenyl intermediates are very important in activating an enzyme that makes vitamin K2 active. So when you take a cholesterol reducing medicine and studies after studies have shown that by design, you're going to increase vascular calcification. You're not going to reduce it. So if our need to give this man a statin as a result of his coronary calcium score, I would say that that is perhaps a little misplaced. Um, but in terms of treating him differently, my advice to him would be that, look, your fat cells are probably less healthy than this other young lady who has healthier fat cells. You probably have a greater inflammation that you need to improve, not just with low carb, but perhaps with more regular fasting, perhaps even long-term fasting, and that perhaps you would need to be investigated whether the coronary calcium is on the outside and hence non-obstructive or whether it's on the inside and perhaps repeat the coronary calcium score depending on his age in about three to five years. So that is the way I would view those two people differently. I would not be a statin proponent in the obese man with uh, the 99th percentile calcium if that answers your question. Wow, and, and would you yeah, it, be it supplementing does. or recommending like K2, D3, anything? Do you think anything along those lines where you see benefit of saying, okay, look, I wanna do something? Because if I do nothing, I, I think, uh, Troy, I, I, I echo your question. I have a guy who comes in, he goes, I wanna be off my statin and I'm gonna lose, I, well, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't watch his diet, he's eating tons of carbs, he's eating. I'm like, you're a sitting duck. I, I, legally, I'm looking at it saying, whether it's right or wrong, taking him off the statin drug sets me up for legal risk. Cause they'll say, you have this obese guy who doesn't take care of himself, doesn't exercise, eating cookies all day and you take him off his statin drug. Now he had a heart attack, it's your fault doctor, right? So I think we really have to step back and look at lifestyle and say, okay, how do I decrease your risk? If we know that elevated insulin uh, is the problem or, or insulin resistance, however we want to look at hyperinsulinemia, whatever term we want to use this week, um, we have to look at that and say, I, for, for looking at the data I'm looking at, I'm saying, look, if I take your A1C, Nadir, I'd like to hear what you have to say. If I take your A1C from an 8.5 and I bring it down to a 4, 4.5, doesn't that increase your decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease way more than lowering your LDL from 180 to 140? Amen. Wait, just, can, I, can I chime in? Can I chime in right, right before? So this is, you know, this is the one thing I want to want to say. This, this, that particular patient that you said, uh, Dr. Nadir, that you'd look at a little bit more aggressively. Um, you know, the, the reason why I bring this up is I was reviewing the MISA data, uh, the MISA trial over at the St. Francis heart, uh, heart trial, actually, and they found that these high CAC score patients did better on, you know, plus or minus aspirin, plus or minus statin, so much so that it was like the number needed to treat dramatically reduced. So I thought to myself, you know, and tell me, is there an error in my thinking? You know, if there is a patient that might benefit, you know, from aspirin or statin, it's that patient with a very high CAC score. Or maybe what, what, we, what we really should be doing, like you suggested, is looking into do they have coronary artery disease? You know, do they need a stress test? Do they need a, um, you know, that, that uh, uh, CT angio? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are very much along the same lines, and uh, I would agree with you that there are certain individuals in which 
you would say, hey, I don't want to be so vehement about telling them that statins may not be your best bet, especially if, like Brian says, this person is not going to change his diet. He's going to remain insulin resistant. He's going to remain pre-diabetic. He's going to have high inflammation scores. So then you are getting into the territory in which you're going to say, hey, if he's not going to do all of these, what is my legal liability of telling him to stop the statin? And so this is where I differ with my colleagues in the sense that I don't tell anybody to stop a statin. I give them informed consent. I tell them the risks. I tell them the benefits. I take them through clinical trials. I take them through the best clinical trial possible. So like, for example, let's take a clinic, a diabetic trial. And I think there are two trials on diabetes, one done right before 2004 and one done right after 2004. I think the first one was the, was the CARDS trial. So the CARDS trial, C-A-R-D-S. So the CARDS trial took patients who were diabetics, divided them into two groups. One group got statin, another group did not get statin. And I think at the end of a number of years, the reduction in mortality, and I don't have the data right in front of me, was about 1.5%. So mortality reduction data was not that impressive when you look at over multiple years, but this was a study done before 2004. Now, right after 2004, there was another study done, and I think this was called ASPEN, A-S-P-E-N. And in that trial, same number of patients as in the previous trial, that their diabetes was a little worse compared to the previous trial. And when you looked at the data of mortality difference, there was no difference. So there is a lot of conflicting data in statin trials. One trial shows a benefit, another trial fails to show a benefit. And the statin trial data should also be taken in the context of all the information that I'm gonna tell you right now, which is that up until 2004, 2005, the 2005 timeframe. So 2004 to 2005 timeframe was a very important landmark in clinical trial history because up until then, a drug company could do 10 trials and only show the one trial that portrayed its drug in good light and suppress the other nine because that's when the Vioxx affair came out in which there were fraudulent practices by Merck in which they suppressed data on people having heart attacks on Vioxx. Um, they put pressure on the FDA to manipulate the data and all of this came out in testimony. So Congress at that time came out and said to a company that if you do a clinical trial you have to register that clinical trial and publish the data at least in an online format. And ever since 2004, the degree of benefit in terms of mortality reduction for a, reduction for a similar reduction in cholesterol has gone down dramatically. Like for example, many people are in the habit of talking about the Jupiter trial. So the Jupiter trial had 18,000 patients, 9,000 in each group. The reduction in mortality, in overall mortality, was minuscule, was less than 1%. I think if I were to remember correctly, between 0.5 to 0.6%. What was the reduction in the level of LDL? Was it 25%? Was it 30% like in the previous trials? or was it almost 50%? So in the Jupiter trial, the reduction in cholesterol, LDL cholesterol was 50%. So if LDL is a culprit molecule, in other words, lower the LDL, the better the person should do, it did not manifest in these trials. I can take the new PCSK9 study, which is, uh, 28,000 patients, the Fourier trial, 28,000 patients, 14,000 getting PCSK9 plus a statin, their LDL dropping to 30 milligrams per deciliter. 
So here is a fundamental question that I want to put out to all the physicians that we talk to, that if you take a 28,000 patient clinical trial, and at the end of that study, you say that there is no mortality difference, and yet you want to talk as if this study is giving you an important insight, it's a ridiculous question to ask, right? I mean, just am I, am I, am I an idiot? In saying yes. that? You're pre no, no, you're preaching to the choir. They treated 28,000 people for over a year to two years, and there was no difference in cardiovascular, uh, in overall mortality. There was a right. mild difference in cardiovascular mortality, but it was nominal. I mean, look, you're preaching to the choir, and some people may listen to me and say, oh, you're being hard on Dr. Nadir, but you're one of the brightest minds, and everything you're saying is absolutely right. Um, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. And we should be focusing on lifestyle like you are. Well, well, I think another one I would, Nadir, I would love to hear what you have to say about this. Um, Malcolm Kendrick was on uh, the, the Fat Emperor podcast, which it was, yeah. for me, I was stunned by what he was talking about, talking about kids with sickle cell having atherosclerosis when they're 14 years old all through their body. But he's talking about the, the glycocalyx, the, the lining of the blood vessels when you get damaged there. And I think this is what you're saying too. You get damaged there and then the body's trying to repair it. And, you know, it was very interesting. Kids are getting their legs amputated, having heart attacks and strokes from atherosclerosis because of the damage done when they get the sickle disease. Um, and then we see the same kind of damage done with diabetes. And, and so I'm just curious because one of the points that he made that I, I wasn't really aware of, he was saying that, that statin drugs do increase nitric oxide in, in the blood vessels. And that may have some kind of protective role on this glycocalyx, which is a, the mm -hmm. way they describe it, is kind of like the slippery stuff on the outside of a fish. It protects and it keeps everything greased up so that you, you don't impinge on the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels. Um, very interesting. Some of the points you were making were very valid. It's like talking about also the hypertension that we don't see atherosclerosis all through our venous system, but then now you take that vein, put it in as a bypass, and now you get atherosclerosis in there when it's, in a, when it's acting as an artery under an elevated pressure level. So all those things are saying it's the damage to the endothelium that is the initiating factor of what we're seeing. It's, yeah, you it's, forgot Kawasaki's, I, yeah, yeah, you Kawasaki's. forgot Kawasaki's disease and all the va vasculitis and all of these which are associated, you know, aneurysm which then become uh, nidesis for coronary atherosclerosis. You know, all of these things are non-cholesterol based and yet they cause atherosclerosis and nobody talks about it. I, you know, just to echo the same point. So, yeah, and, and you know, you can, I think what, what we are all trying to say is that how can the entire medical profession be dishonest? And how can there be so much statin data and how can we say that all of that should be thrown out and should not be believed? And there may be some glimmer of hope in what Dr. Kendrick is talking about, but at the same time, you gotta realize that even though statins by one mechanism increase nitric oxide, through another mechanism, they decrease it because statins are an important factor of causing insulin resistance. And we know that insulin resistance is an important marker that reduces nitric oxide. So statins do have certain effects that can reduce cancer risk, but also increase cancer risk by some of the mechanisms through which they affect the lipid metabolism. So yeah, I will grant you that, but you know, as a skeptic, as a critical thinker, uh, you got to put the following questions also in your mind, that when a clinical trial is done, who pays the hospital that's doing the clinical trial? It is the industry. Who pays the investigator who is doing the clinical trial? It is the industry. When the data, when the information is gathered from all these various clinical trial sites where they are doing research, where does it go to? It goes to the pharmaceutical industry. They hire a team of experts to look at this data and see whether this data is robust and correct. Who pays them? It's again the pharmaceutical industry. Who pays the FDA? And not, not only that, not only that, but then they don't even share the negative trial data from the years past. And on top of all this, when they share the data amongst themselves to promote statin, 
with the CTT group, they don't share any of the, the side effect data. They refuse to share the side effect data. So it's co- quite an evil, uh, not evil, but it's nefarious, I'd say, the way they have set it up. Oh, I could not agree more because uh, case report forms, that is, investigator-initiated case report forms should be shared freely with organizations such as the Cochrane Collaboration or some other independent organization that will say, hey, I want to look at the robustness of your information. I want to see if it is truly valid. And the entire system is paid by one actor and there are no checks and balances in a clinical trial that would make me trust it and say, hey, I can rely on this data and that I can suspend my critical thinking when I'm looking at a clinical trial. I can leave my individual clinical experience and say, hey, I look at the study, I can take it at face value. The very same clinical investigators, uh, Steve Nissen, a few others who said that the incidence of myopathy was less than 1%. But when it came time to promoting PCSK9 inhibitors and when they were on a PCSK9 panel, they start saying that the number of people with statin-induced myopathy is 20%. So it went from 1% to 20% when it was sort of convenient for you to promote a different drug. Don't get me started on Stephen Nissen. Because uh, he said, oh, you know, nobody should be getting CAC scores. They cost $800. You know, why, why don't they just take the statin drug? Meanwhile, a CAC score costs $100, 50 to $100 in most private imaging centers. You know, it's, 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 I can't even, I can't agree more with you about and the we're, And we're willing to pay out of pocket. Most of us, will, I'll pull a hundred bucks. I did pull a hundred bucks out and paid and got mine done too. Cause I want to make sure I'm right when I'm talking about. And again, everyone, we cannot give individualized medical advice. As we always say, you have to take this up with your doc and talk to them about it. But I think, um, you know, we're not telling everyone to stop their stands. We're not saying that we're saying, Hey, look, talk to your doc. And, and I think the big picture of what we're saying is look, make yourself healthier. If you are eating a ton of carbohydrates and your sugars are through the roof, you've got to make a change because that puts you at major cardiovascular risk by all the mechanisms that we're discussing here. You're damaging the endothelium, you're putting cholesterol in, and you know, you're causing inflammation, you got red blood cells, you got platelets, you have all these things that set us up for, so, for heart attacks and strokes. So I think it's one of those things like, okay, what else will increase my nitric oxide in my blood vessels? Exercise. Um, staying active, watching your stress level, you know, so you want to protect that layer. You want to protect your, your, your vessels. So the big take home is it's not all about LDL cholesterol. I mean, that's all we talk about. And with the, um, uh, endocrine society, all of us are starting to look and say, this metabolic disease is a problem and we need to get to the bottom of it. So the same people are saying, well, that's super dangerous. They're clearly not looking at all these factors that we're talking about that all the experts are saying cause cardiovascular disease. It's so, it, it's infuriating really, because you can say, hey, how do, so Dr. Lee, if, if you wanted to give people advice, you say, you're my patient, what, what simple steps can you take that would make your life healthier, longer, better? Um, one thing I just love that, that we just had a great podcast with Ben Bickman, and I said, Ben, what's the, the secret to longevity and feeling well and all that stuff? He says, you know what, Brian? make your body as sensitive to insulin as it can be. The lower your insulin is, the longer you're going to live. And I think those things tie into all these other things that we're talking about. So I would love to hear your opinion and and what you would say to me coming to you as a patient, like, Hey, how do I decrease my risk the most? So uh, in many ways, I agree with what Ben is telling and what you are preaching. Um, The most important aspect of our human body is for us to realize that We have evolved for a certain nutrition. And uh, the nutrition that we have evolved for is predominantly animal-based food, animal-based protein, animal-based fat, because we don't make any uh, omega-3, which our brain needs, especially the DHA and EPA. And you can get that from plant food. 
the way our digestive biology is designed, we have an acid-based digestion. And acid-based digestion is more suitable for an animal-sourced nutrition. We have a very large absorptive surface, which is the small intestines. And we have very little fermenting capacity, which is our colon. In fact, the size of our colon is only 10% the size of our ape ancestors who were predominantly eating vegetarian matter. And our colon is at the end of our digestion. So that's the reason why we are not designed like cows. Now the cows have a stomach that is four stomachs and they can eat this grass, which is basically fiber and ferment the fiber in their stomach into fat. If we were designed as vegetarians, our digestive system would have looked like that. We are not designed like that. Now, we are also not designed so much to eat raw food because our processing capacity for the food is limited. And I think one of the reasons the human brain shot up to such a tremendous size is because we not only ate animal food, but we learned how to cook it. When you cook the food, you pre-digest it. And so you don't need to process it as well. So that's why when you look at small intestines, which is about 56% of the volume of our digestive tract, the human digestion is predominantly designed to absorb simple food rapidly. So you would say, hey, starch is simple food, Sugar is simple food, so you are saying we are designed to also consume that. But unfortunately, we are not. The reason we are not is because our pancreas is sort of rudimentary. It's not a very strong pancreas. So we cannot handle either glycemic load, which would be a large amount of carbohydrate, or a glycemic index, which would be very simple carbohydrate that gets rapidly into our bloodstream. So what I would like to submit is that the way to health for most humans is to eat a predominantly animal sourced food and add vegetable matter to their liking. The second most important aspect of our biology is that we evolved in an environment in which nutrition was not readily available. We went through significant periods of nutrient deficiency. So our body is designed for that. So if you are not going to not only follow the kind of nutrition we need to follow, but also practice intermittent fasting, because intermittent fasting is one of the primary mechanisms by which our body clears out junk. And our brain needs intermittent fasting more than the rest of our body because the way the brain ages is by having protein aggregates. And those protein aggregates are only going to be cleared if you are in a nutrient depleted environment as some of the new literature and studies are coming out. So if I were to give lifestyle advice to somebody and I don't talk about the appropriate nutrition and at the same time, I don't talk about intermittent fasting and I don't talk about how important exercise is from a standpoint of maintaining your musculature from the standpoint of creating ATP deficiency so that autophagy is promoted, I would say that I have not done a good job. Man, I can't add any more than that. You know, this is exactly what we're saying. That. God, I think you, it's you pure to, wisdom right here. Yeah. And you have to understand the physiology because I could tell you, I've had a CGM on and I'm looking at it and it makes me laugh because if I fast all day, my sugars go up, right? If I fast all the next day, my sugars go up. If I have a glass of wine, my sugars go down. If I exercise, my sugars shoot up like crazy sometimes. If, if, if I'm doing aerobic exercise, it'll shoot up to 140. So if I was just looking at numbers, I'd say, okay, just drink wine all day, don't exercise, right? Eat all day long and you'll bring your sugars down. It just, 
it, you, you have to look at the whole thing. And we know that when people are fasting, their, their LDL goes up. We've learned so much from the mechanisms of how our body survives. And so everything you're saying is right on when you start understanding that this, it's this, and, and, and I just recently said that on Twitter, it's, it's this excess of calories. This, we do much better in times of famine than times of excess of feasting, right, at, over time. And exactly what you're saying is like, hey, this, this whole autophagy idea, all these things that we're seeing of people doing better by taking control of their life, lives. And so you know, what you're doing is preventing people from ending up in the cath labs. And it's so, I, I so respect your courage because, and I put you up there with Gary Fetke, Tim Noakes, all these people who said, hey, I'm going to go against the paradigm because that is what is correct and that's what's working to make people healthy. And you'll get ridiculed at, at professional meetings. The drug reps aren't going to want to talk to you. The, the stent guys aren't going to want to talk to you because you're not a source of income anymore. And unfortunately, that's how we, we're, we're seeing it in medicine. And you see the amount of money that people are taking and it's devastating. You know, and To be able to step back and say, look, it's kind of like troll people, uh, you know, say, oh, these guys are in this to make money. We self fund this podcast. We have no funding. We have not, no industry, but, and it takes me longer to explain all this stuff to a patient than just say, oh, here's a stat and go out the door. Here's a, here's blood pressure. Here, here's something for your mood. Here's a, cause that's quick and easy and, and docs don't want to be bothered. And I think that is part of the situation of our disastrous uh, healthcare system right now. We have a lot of sick people that we're not, we're waiting to, we're the best at putting stents in. We're really, really, really good at that for sure. But, Gosh, wouldn't it be better to prevent it before that happens? And I, and I think I just want to echo one point here, that there's nuance here. You know, myself, yourself, doc, you know, uh, Nadir, Dr. Ali, none of us are saying don't take your statin. We're saying, look, there's a tiny, minuscule benefit. There's potential for harm, and you have to take it for a long time. None of us are saying that, you know, uh, drug companies, you know, uh, they're evil. You know, in fact, I did say that. But really, what we're saying is, look, there's a lot of potential for issues when they're running the show and when they're not sharing the negative trial data. And I think everything that you guys have said here this is going to help so many people. And I'm just, I'm, you know, I, we could spend probably another half hour talking about, you know, insulin resistance and and uh, other nutritional issues. I just amazing. To hear from you and and it's always insightful for to hear from you dr ali well and speaking of preventive medicine we have to transition tro because we could talk for 10 hours i know we're over and uh nadir thank you so much for staying with us uh i want to let people know about what you're doing for prevention what are you doing you're doing low carb houston coming up i'd love to give some details to people who are interested who are listening saying you know what i'd love to come here all these smart guys tro the only problem i have you and i aren't speaking there so he's got good speakers and and uh Maybe we can come clean up afterwards or something. We can like people do something. Like that. I don't know, but I, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm joking. Know, but tell us, us what you us got going. Lowly, you know, us lowly par- primary care doctors, you know, we don't we don't get these, you know, these hotshot cardiologists like Christian Assad and Dr. Ali and Brett Scher and you know, uh, they, they're the ones who who need to get out there. Not 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 people like you and me. Hey, uh, let me tell you this. I'm going to take myself off of the schedule and include you and Brian right now, if you agree to come, it would be an absolute honor for you to come and and you would be my special guest. So, uh, and and the reason I didn't uh, ask you guys to come is I didn't know if it was worth your while. So let me tell you a little bit about Low Carb Houston. This is the second year we are doing it. It's not for profit conference uh, because uh, last year when we did it, I paid money out of my pocket uh, it's got a very small registration fee. The registration fee goes to University of Houston. It doesn't go into my pocket. And last year we could not meet all the expenses, so I put money out of my pocket. And this year probably we'll have to do the same. But it is worth it. Um, because I think that the most important aspect of what you do and I do is to give back to the community. And, and my way, and I'm very fortunate because being a physician, you make a good living. And I feel that it makes me relevant when I give back to the community in terms of nutrition, fasting, exercise, lifestyle. And this does not cost them anything. It's not drugs, it's not procedures. So that's a way to improve their health. Um, I, we invite speakers to talk about 
all the nuances that we went through right now, the set will be staged as what insulin resistance is through Jeff Gerber. There is a young cardiologist who's going to come and talk about coronary artery calcium score. David Diamond is going to give a talk on why the statin data is something that should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, there is going to be information about animal sourced food and carnivore diet from Amber O'Hearn. There is a lot of talk in the media that if you eat animal food, you're destroying the environment, that it is not sustainable. You're creating to carbon pollution. And Peter Ballastad is there to rescue us. He's there to tell us that ruminant agriculture is actually very important for carbon capture, to reduce our carbon footprint. I wanted to create a balance in here, in this conference. And the balance I wanted to create by inviting people who are statin proponents, who are cholesterol proponents, who are LDL proponents, so I reached out to Steve Nissen. I reached out to Peter Atia. I reached out to Christy Ballantyne. I reached out to Peter Jones. So I reached out to all of these people saying that, hey, come to my conference and say what you want to say. Convince me and convince the people who are coming here that you have the right message about LDL, about statins, about PCSK9 inhibitors. And every single one of them has refused. I spent one, sorry, I spent three hours with Sanofi, the maker of Praluent, which is a PCSK9 inhibitor this past Monday, saying that, send me a speaker. I've approached all of these people, they have refused. Why are they refusing? Why are they so scared of being critically reviewed in a conference like this? Because they will be speaking to people who have a sophisticated understanding of lipoprotein met metabolism, of cholesterol, of the side effects of statins, and that would be the best situation for them to make their case. So if you know of somebody who can be a statin promote proponent and come and talk about that at my conference, I would rearrange the schedule and get him on. Wow, wow. I think well, I you're going to hear some crickets after that, you know. You're going to hear crickets, especially if, it, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, well, how much do I get paid to come talk, right? I mean, it's, it, it, it is a sad statement of where we are in medicine. And, and that's why, you know, I was teasing you at the beginning, but that shows your integrity to say, look, I will now step out of the cath lab because I can help these people before that step. You know, Gary Fetke, all these people that we've mentioned already. I have such immense, Rob, Rob Sivas, I have immense respect for all of you because, you're taking a hit. You're getting criticized by your peers that don't understand it at the level you understand. If I sit down with a cardiologist friend of mine, I guarantee they're not going to, other than Brett Scher, who, who we, train, we train together, and I know his, his knowledge of the, of the data, and he's of the same opinion as you. Um, you know, it, it, it's astounding how much we've been told um, something over and over, and we just believe it to be true. And no matter what anyone says, what the data says, we, we're going to interpret it by what we've been told. And it's tragic at some point. And Tro, Tro said it best. is like, hey, you, you're critical thinkers that step back and say, what does the data show? What does my clinical experience show? What does my patient experience show? And when you realize uh, they don't match up to what everyone says they should, you know? So Tro, do you want to oh, – and let's, let's again say the dates on that, on so, the conference. Uh, Low Carb Houston is October 24th to 26th. It's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, there is uh, Vinny, uh, is Vinny Tortorich is going to show Fats, a documentary on Friday, and all the uh, people that he interviewed in the film, uh, a number of those faculty members are going to be there at the conference. So there's going to be a, a sort of a question and answer session with those people. Um, there are a few key things uh, that make this conference a little unique. One of them is that the IDM group with Brenda Zahn is going to take 10 people and put them through a three-day fast during the conference. And this is a supervised three-day fast. Uh, I'm going to be available along with my nurse practitioners as a physician if, in case something is to happen. They're going to get ketone meters, blood sugar meters. We're going to monitor their blood pressures, their weights. And we're going to 
go through their experience at the end of the conference. So this is called the Zone Fast, and there's going to be a Zone Room in which these people are going to get coached. So if somebody is interested in fasting, they can attend that session and get the coaching themselves. Another uh, unique aspect of this conference is that uh, uh, LabCorp with Kim Howerton and Dave Feldman are going to do a detailed lipoprotein profile, insulin resistance, inflammation panel at very low cost. So there's going to be a lab set up to get your blood drawn in case you're interested in that blood draw. And then um, we are going to address all aspects of low carb lifestyle from nutrition to fasting to its effects of ketogenic diet on bipolar disorders and such. Um, I'm really excited. I mean, this is what drives me uh, when I go to a conference and when I meet the likes of Brian and Tro, they say, man, my day is made because I learn so much from you all. If I were not a part of this community, my knowledge would not be one-tenth as good. The only reason I know all this is because I associate with you all. Man, that, you know, obviously you know our respect for you and that's, you know, I got goosebumps. Tro, he goes on and lies and says we're, we know something. That's super awesome of, of him. That shows how kind he is. But no, really, it's, in, in, in all seriousness, it's a great community. We're all learning. We're all willing to say, okay, I thought this, but maybe this is right. Maybe I can have more protein. Maybe this. So I think when you're open and have the courage to say, look, here's what I'm seeing clinically. Here's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing. I, I think it's we all learn from each other. And I've learned so much doing this podcast. Like how much I learned from you in this podcast. I mean, you know what people say, you guys – Spend your own money. You know, how much is this worth to be face to face with you telling us what your clinical experience is, knowing the studies, you know, very few people, unfortunately, in medical practice, we don't have this opportunity very often, right? We don't go and talk to the world renowned cardiologists and all these people. And we don't know who's paid off and who's not. But when you see someone's integrity and that they care, and, and that's why we wanted to have you on to support you. But selfishly, we wanted to learn from you also and, and, and uh, you know, be able to be better doctors. That's what we're called to do you know, to help people and, and to, um, uh, you know, rely on experts who deal with this. And, and, you know, I mean, we're, we're very humbled, happy on, very honored. Tro, close us in prayer, man. Yeah, no, I think just the last thing I'd like to say is, uh, you know, look at what's going on. You're reinvigorated to help people through lifestyle and you're leaving the old ways of take this drug and see me in three months behind. You're leaving the, here's the prescription, see you later. And look at, look at what's happening. There's a resurgence. There's, there's no burnout in the low-carb community. People cannot wait to go back to the clinic. We can't wait. We're busy, and we're, we're happy with what we're doing. And everything you're saying is just – and everything you're doing, reaching out to the community, helping people, the projects you're about to you know, release and talk about are even, even you know, steps better in better directions. It's all, it's all welcomed, and thank you so much for teaching us and uh, – you know, just uh, uh, sharing your wisdom. Yeah. I'm truly so humbled, Tro. I think that praise is not justified, but I will take it uh, in all the humility that I can. And I, I really, truly enjoy talking to you guys. And please come to Low Carb Houston if you can. If not this year, uh, next year you have an open invitation. You can pencil in the talk you want to do and you can select the time you want. All right. That's a deal, man. You guys heard it. I'm re I've got it recorded. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you all for sticking with us. This is a long one, but every single second, I mean, this is my favorite now. I have a favorite. This every week. And this is awesome. Tro, you excited, man. Thank you for listening to the Low Carb MD podcast. We hope you learned something of value today. Please remember to subscribe and rate us on iTunes and Stitcher, as this will help us to get the word out. Please consider supporting this project through a small donation through Patreon. Every penny helps. Until next time.